Carlin, thank you. Good afternoon. And Stenny coming out here, I think, reflects the job that you do and how important it is because it works. There is true bipartisanship surrounding the U.S.-Israel relationship, and that will continue. It's always such an incredible honor to speak to you before you here at APAC. And just as Steny is here, I'm here, many of our colleagues are here, we're here for the same reasons that you're here. You've gathered from all across the country to come here because you have faith, you have commitment, and because you have a love for our great country, America, and her great friend, Israel. You know, America and Israel are two lights among all nations. They're envied by many, but they're also known for their dedication to human freedom, opportunity, and growth. In thinking about the differences in worldviews today that exist, I've come to a conclusion. It is the province of idealists to dream. It is the province of realists to wake up. Now let me emphasize, we do need idealists. Idealism animated America's founding fathers and those of Israel. But we also need idealists who will transition into realists personified by the founding fathers of both America and Israel. In the Middle East, now is the time to be realists, to wake up. To wake up before all dreams turn into an unbearable nightmare. We must stop Iran from developing a nuclear bomb. To minimize the threat, the Iranian threat, is to fall into the same trap that led to the Holocaust, a lack of imagination about how far evil can go. A visit to Israel's Holocaust Memorial, Yad Vashem, provides all of us with a reality check. The first time I went there, I was struck by the Hall of Names. I know many of you have been there, and have seen it. It's a room that contains about two and a half million pages of personal testimonies about the identities and life stories of the six million Jews murdered by the Nazis and their accomplices. Think about it. How tragic that we Jews, known as the people of the book, should have to assemble a book of the slaughter of our innocents. On January 3rd of this year, Iran's President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad spoke darkly of what he called the Zionist regime, Israel. And he referred to, quote, the end point of its existence. But to that, today, let me tell you something, Mr. Ahmadinejad, Israel's existence will endure long after you are God. To ensure that, we have to transition from confusion to clarity in the Middle East. A major source of confusion is where is the leadership? Who is leading from the front with a finger pointing in the right direction rather than a finger pointing into the wind? Make, 
Make no mistake about it, America needs to be a compass, not a weather vane in the Middle East. And even many of Israel's adversaries are clamoring for clarity. They fear Iran's efforts to foment instability and extremism in the region more than they fear Israel, as I found out on my recent visit to countries in the Gulf. They want a balance of power in the Middle East, not an unbalanced power like Iran. And America's role is not to put its hand on the scale and balance it against Israel. America's role is to put its fist on the scale to weigh down the terrorism, fanaticism, and anti-Semitism of Iran and its proxies. So let us not send mixed messages when it comes to Israel. That only serves to confuse the world, including Israel's enemies. As elusive as peace has been in the Middle East, the only way it can be approached is through strength. Time and again, the countries of the Middle East, and especially the terrorists who reside there, have sent the clear message that all they respect all they respond to is strength. Strength is the only language that our enemies and Israel's enemies understand. No translation is required. <laughs> to deny our enemies their deadly options, though, we must keep all options on the table, both diplomatic and military. You know, the time for illusion is over. The reality is that Iran is moving closer and closer to attaining a nuclear weapons capability. And neither Israel nor America can afford to be nuclear reactors. Leadership requires action, not reaction. But to be effective, Leadership requires three assets, superior intelligence, superior capability, and superior will. For years, Iran has been scoffing at the United States and Israel, signaling that it believes it has nothing to lose. America and Israel now must demonstrate that we do have the intelligence, capability, and will, both military and moral, to persuade Iran that we will meet its folly with force. I, for one, do not apologize when I say that Israel and America, while not perfect, have the two most morally responsible militaries in the world. Might exercised with righteousness is might that makes right. And the soldiers of Israel and America are trained to be moral and responsible and are held to the highest ethical standards. Our militaries operate at great expense and with great risk to conduct operations that place a premium on avoiding collateral damage. By contrast, many of our adversaries intentionally target innocent women and children. And when it comes to Iran, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or any of our other enemies, it's just not true that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Because it is not liberty or freedom that our enemies are fighting for. Our enemies have made it plain that they oppose the freedoms that Israel and America uphold. These are freedoms that people worldwide cry out for and often die for. We've seen those people die in the streets of Tehran, Cairo, Tripoli, Aleppo, 
and many other places. So when world bodies such as the United Nations single out Israel as an oppressor, we must ask, have you no eyes? Have you no heart? Have you no judgment? And who are you to judge? Anti-Israel propagandists would have you believe that Israelis have stolen the freedom from the Palestinian people. But what kind of freedom is it when Palestinian terrorists like Hamas and Gaza use their own women, children, and elderly as human shields? They reprehensively calculate that a maximum of civilian casualties will generate a maximum of worldwide condemnation of Israel. What kind of democracy have the Palestinians built for themselves? An intra-Palestinian civil war in Gaza that gave way to a Hamas-controlled terrorist rump state? Or a corrupt Fatah party in the West Bank that has resisted political reforms and undermined Prime Minister Fayyad's efforts to build democratic institutions and promote economic growth? Yes, Israel fights but in self-defense. And it is in self-defense that Israel lives. But you will rarely read of the toll that takes on Israel's own innocence. In 2005, Israel unilaterally pulled out of the Gaza Strip in a concession to try to further peace, leaving the border areas under the control of Egypt and the Palestinians. Since then, the Gaza Strip has been turned into a base for Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other terrorists to lob rocket attacks on Israel. Many of these groups are supported by Iran. Steny talked of Stay Road, and many of us have been, here, been there. It's a city near the Gaza Strip, and it's been the target of those attacks, those rocket attacks, for years. When I last visited there, I was told a story about life for one Israeli mother and her young children. In just six months, more than 160 rockets were fired at their city. And when a rocket is detected, a siren goes off. It gives residents about 15 seconds to rush for shelter in the safe room of a house or in a car, anywhere they can flee to protect themselves. This constant barrage has traumatized this women's children. They're afraid to leave her side. They have regressed in their growth habits, like the bathroom training. Their anxieties are so intense that if they hear a car door slam, they jump with fright, sometimes under a table. Sadly, this reminds me of Golda Meir's remark that peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. So, so we've got to stop following mirages in the Middle East, and we've got to start following through on this reality. Our mission in the Middle East is to drive our stake in the sand with our values, to proclaim our values rather than apologize for them. And no, no country, no country in the Middle East stands aligned with America's values more than Israel. Start with the American Bill of Rights and the value of freedom of the speech. In Israel, there's so much freedom of speech, it can make your head spin. Sadly, as we've seen elsewhere in the Middle East, attempting freedom of speech can make you lose your head. Consider the American value of freedom of religion. In Israel, you're not only free to practice any religion you wish, you can choose to practice no religion at all. Now, where else in the Middle East can that happen? Then there's the American value of freedom of the press. In Israel, there's the old joke of two Jews, three opinions. And you can get all those opinions in the newspapers, on TV, and on the internet, on the radio, even on the graffiti on the walls. Elsewhere in the Middle East, sometimes when you publish, you perish. 
So let's look at the American value of freedom of assembly. To come together in meetings, discuss problems, and plan actions in a peaceful way, and also to petition your government. But let's be honest. Israel is not only known for its kibbutzniks, it's especially known for its kibitzers. To meet, talk, plan, protest, and that includes criticizing your government. That is in Israeli's DNA. But in countries that surround Israel, large and small gatherings of citizens voicing their concerns too often produces bloodshed, brutality, and jail sentences. Finally, in America and Israel, women's rights are deeply enshrined in our laws and our cultures. And there are many protections for minorities, whether they be religious, racial, or of sexual orientation. But as you travel through other parts of the Middle East, women and minorities are suppressed and repressed, denied rights and their dignity. Because Israel shares American values, Americans should value Israel all the more. And America's job should not be to micromanage Israel. It should be to macromanage the proliferation of our values in the Middle East, values that Israel cherishes just as we do. Now, it's often said that if you don't stand up for something, you'll put up with anything. This is another thing I heard in country after country in my recent trip to the Gulf. Confusion about where America stands has raised questions about some of our leaders in Washington and what they're willing to put up with. And that's not just Iran, about Iran, that's not just about Syria, it's not just about Egypt, and it's not just about Libya. In order to see the bigger picture in the Middle East, some in Washington must stop standing small, stooping to belittle Israel by taking for granted its sacrifices, its security, and its solidarity with America. We must stand tall by our allies, and no ally stands taller for us than Israel. We must stand by our commitments, and no commitment is greater than Israel's is to us. Let's, let us do unto Israel as Israel keeps doing unto us. Loyalty deserves loyalty. Trust merits trust in return. And that's why, as Steny indicated, we appreciate your going to the Hill tomorrow to advocate on behalf of the resolution that he and I are co-sponsoring, the U.S.-Israel Enhanced Cooperation Act of 2012, to set it in law that this country and Israel will stand together in an alliance forever. The reality is that Israel has a problematic situation, but Israel is not the real problem in the Middle East. The problem is that you can't negotiate with those who deny your very existence. And when nations or terrorists openly proclaim their unshakable determination to destroy you, to wipe you off the map, to visit a holocaust upon you, whether you're America or Israel, you don't sit around and talk about even-handedness and moral equivalency.
You come down firmly and you do what is right, what is real and required. In America and in Israel, there is much disagreement about policy, and plenty of us politicians argue about them day in and day out. But in both countries, most of the politicians have shown themselves capable of uniting around a single cause. And that cause is that Israel deserves not just to survive, but to thrive. Many of us have been to pray at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And there, people from around the world stuff messages written on paper in between the stones of the ancient wall. The message I'd like to place in that wall, signed jointly by the leaders of America and Israel, is a single phrase in Hebrew, l'chaim, to life. So let us all, let us all resolve to come together around that very message, that single message of life. And long live America, long live Israel, and long live righteous people in the Middle East and everywhere around the world. Thank you very, very much.